evening, everyone. At the outset, I would like to welcome everyone to the webinar on Deepening India-ASEAN Relations, Exploring New Avenues for Engagements, jointly organized by India Exim Bank, ASEAN India Center at the RIS, and the ASEAN India Business Council, as a run-up to the ASEAN India Summit 2021. I am Banarwa Dafanai, President Representative of Exim Bank Singapore Office. I will be your host today. There will be two parts in today's webinar, the inaugural session and the panel discussion session, in which experts will deliberate on various relevant topics on deepening India-ASEAN relations. Now may I request everyone to please join me in welcoming our distinguished speakers at the inaugural session. He is Harsha Bangari, Managing Director, Exim Bank of India. Dato Ramesh Podamal, Co-Chair, ASEAN India Business Council. Professor Sachin Chaturvedi, Director General, RIS, and member, Board of Directors, RBI, and the chief guest of today's webinar, Ms. Riva Ganguly Das, Secretary is Ministry of External Affairs, Government of India. To begin with, I would now like to request Ms. Harsha Bangari, Managing Director, Exim Bank of India, to deliver the opening remarks for today's event. Madam, please. Thank you. Ms. Riva Ganguly Das, Secretary East, Ministry of External Affairs, Government of India. His Excellency, Mr. Jayant Kobragade, Indian Ambassador to ASEAN, Government of India. Dato Ramesh Kondamal, Co-Chair, ASEAN India Business Council, Kuala Lumpur. Professor Sachin Chaturvedi, Director General, Research and Information System for Developing Countries. Uh, Secretary Carlito G. Galvez, Presidential Advisor on the Peace Process, Vaccine Czar and Chief Implementer of National Task Force Against COVID-19, Government of the Philippines. Uh, Dr. Uh, Teodoro J. Herbosa, Special Advisor, Philippines National Task Force Against COVID-19. Uh, Professor Ruth uh, Banomyong, Dean, uh, Thamasat Business School, Thamasat University. Dr. Rajan Ratna, Deputy Head and Senior Economic Affairs Officer, UNISCAP. Uh, Mr. Mohammed Irshad, Head of Corporate Affairs for ASEAN, Tata Consultancy Services, Asia Pacific. Uh, Dr. Prabir De, Professor and Coordinator, ASEAN India Center at RIS. Representatives from the embassies, government, industry, academia, and think tanks. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and good evening. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome you all to the webinar on Deepening India-ASEAN Relations, Exploring New Avenues for Engagements, jointly organized by the India Exim Bank, the ASEAN India Center at RIS, and the ASEAN India Business Council as a run-up to the 18th ASEAN India Summit 2021. Thank you for being with us today. Uh, through this webinar, we seek to draw a roadmap for strengthening the India-ASEAN economic relationship based on the experience of the stakeholders, while identifying opportunities for closer collaboration in diversified areas in the post-COVID world. Today, ASEAN has evolved into one of the most dynamic economic regional groupings in the world. According to the ADB, Southeast Asia is expected to rebound and grow by 3.1% in 2021, from a contraction of 4% seen in the previous year. Uh, this is supported by rising demand for electronics, mechanical machinery, and vehicles. The region's expanding economic and geopolitical importance, along with sophisticated manufacturing capabilities and diversified exports, made it a global powerhouse and a world leader in electronics, automobiles, and high technology goods. Historically, India and ASEAN economies have been enjoying a strong and cordial relationship. ASEAN is a strategic pathway for India to expand its economic interests and strategic outreach to the Asia-Pacific Asia region, with Myanmar sharing a border with four Indian states in North, uh, India's northeast region. ASEAN and India together represent a combined population of over 2 billion, which is more than a quarter of the global population. Uh, and with the inception of the ASEAN-India Trade in Goods Agreement, uh, merchandise trade between India and ASEAN nearly doubled from US dollar 44 billion in FI 20, uh, 2010 to US dollar 87 billion in FI 2020, uh, which is moderated slightly because of the COVID uh, pandemic in the recent past. India and ASEAN economies are steadily emerging as preferred alternative investment destination for several multinational companies also. Uh, considering ASEAN's proximity to India and the complementarities of the two economies, there is a huge potential for strengthening two-way trade and investment. 
uh, India Exim Bank's research study, which would be released in this webinar, identified the significant potential that exists to enhance India's trade and investment relations with ASEAN in creating a strong regional value chain, especially in sectors such as automobiles and auto components uh, sector, electronics, healthcare, as well as agribusiness and food processing. As India and ASEAN economies on, are on their way back to normalcy, there is a need for an urgent call for action to strengthen these engagements. It is incumbent on all stakeholders to heighten India's India ASEAN's multifaceted partnership, which would not only help to shape a new Asia by strengthening multipolarity in the region, but also strengthen India's vision of the Indo-Pacific Indo with ASEAN centrality uh, at its core. ASEAN has always been a focus region for India Exim Bank, which has been reflected in the various activities and programs the bank has set in place. Moreover, India Exim Bank is the empowered institution for the government of India's CLMV Project Development Fund to facilitate Indian investments and broaden the manufacturing base of Indian companies in the CLMV region. I am sure the deliberations and the perspectives that would be shared by the speakers today would contribute to grow, drawing a roadmap on further strengthening the India-ASEAN partnership. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Now, may I request uh, Dato Ramesh Kodamal, co-chair, ASEAN India Business Council, AIBC, Kuala Lumpur, to deliver a special address. Secretary East, Minister, Ministry of External Affairs, Harsha Magari, Managing Director, Export Bank, distinguished personalities who are here today. Most of them I do know. Some of them I'm beginning to know. I think this particular event which we have organized between AIC, AIBC, and with the Export Exim Bank is actually something which is very great for us to move forward. Deepening Indian-ASEAN relationship, exploring new avenues for engagement has always been the agenda for India and ASEAN. But after the pandemic, we are beginning to see that we have lagged behind for the last 18 months and how we can revamp ourselves to move forward. That is actually within us. I think we should not look at that. The pandemic is a pandemic. Might be, it has been bad for some, it has been good for some. But it has taught us a lot of lessons on how we can have better relationship with the region. Especially for ASEAN, we have learned a lot of lessons. We know who our friends are and who we can depend on. AIBC has always taken an agenda to see how close we can work with India. And India, as we know that uh, the first person, Harsha has already mentioned, that we have got a close population of 2 billion collectively together. That is not the only thing. We have got a young population, which is the highest in the world in this region. That is what is more important for us to look into the future. The young group, the young population, 98% of the SMEs, which are moving forward and are beginning to grow to different levels. That is what we have to look at. The women which we have within the ASEAN region who are young entrepreneurs, how are we going to bring them up? The digitization which India and ASEAN has got in their mind, how are we going to develop it and bring it up to a different level? These are all the questions which we have in mind within ASEAN and India. I think Chak East has always been speaking about ASEAN and India, and she has actually put in a lot of effort to see that this relationship moves forward. And we understand this. But there are certain things we have to explore. We have to have a soul searching thing within ourselves. Where are we going wrong? What is it that we need to do to open up our hearts and to move forward? We have to be very frank about ourselves. AIBC has always taken an opportunity at various forums and various talks to speak from the heart and the mind to see how we can come up with solutions to forward the growth between ASEAN and India. ASEAN and India have been together for time and memorial for centuries when the trade first started. India and ASEAN were always together in this region. But now we feel that we are ASEAN, we are the countries in Southeast Asia, and India is India. No, we are all linked. We need to link ourselves further. I've always said 
that we need to communicate with us better. We need to link ourselves together. And communication needs to be linked by every part of ASEAN country to India. Every place in India with the flight, you can just touch and reach base in ASEAN. So I think we have to come up with solution. This morning, I was just going through the paper and I saw that the first bullet train has started from Laos to China. Why can't India and ASEAN look at the same expect that we can have a bullet train from here to Bangkok might be in time to come? Let's explore. Let's look into it. Let's have the heart to feel. Prime Minister Modi has always looked at the Act East policy. How are we actually working on the Act East policy, which is a fantastic policy, with billions of dollars, which Indian government has already assured that they'll be pumping in, in the Northeast. What advantage are we taking? A latest statement has come up from Prime Minister Modi, built up the palm oil estates in the Northeast from the ASEAN side. We should explore this. We should look into it. Now with the COVID, we also have the medical problems which we face, the pharmaceutical need in ASEAN, the COVID vaccine which we have, which India is always there to provide us. We can work with them. Our businessmen should start linking. I thank Exim Bank for having this actually webinar talk because we feel that the banks play a very important part in moving businesses because they provide the funding. Without their funding, businesses cannot move. And Exim Bank plays a very important role here. And I believe that in ASEAN, in Singapore, we have six to seven Indian banks. In Malaysia, we have an Indian bank. In Indonesia, we have Indian bank. In Thailand, we have Indian bank. Why don't we start working out a formula where Exim Bank can link with this Indian bank to explore, to see how they can further improve the investment in ASEAN. Because what is important here is not only the investment in ASEAN, what is important is how are we going to have a supply chain from ASEAN to India to work together. The supply chain is very important. Even though Indians come and invest in ASEAN, they can have a supply chain moving towards India. And ASEAN members can also move to India to create the supply chain for ASEAN. I think there are a lot of things which we can explore. AIBC has always been very neutral in its thinking with only one intention to see that ASEAN and India moves forward, we develop, we grow, we link, and we need each other for the coming years. And I think this century, no doubt, is the century for Asia. And the biggest people who are moving forward in Asia today is India and ASEAN looking together. I just read the report yesterday that the GDP figures from World Bank with state that India GDP will be 9.5% next year. It's amazing. I think these are facts which are coming out, not by us, but by the World Bank. ASEAN figures are going up to 6% next year. It's fantastic. So what are we waiting for? It is time for us to work out, plan out, strategize to see. I can assure you that AIBC's intention is to work towards to see that the ASEAN-India trade moves up to 200 billion by 2025. This is a figure which we are looking at and we are plugging it in and we know that next year is 30 years of ASEAN-India relationship. And this is going to be a fantastic year. This is a marketing year for ASEAN-India to spring up, to work forward, to say that we need to move forward. I think this is a fantastic time which we are going into 2022 with 30 years of relationship. Secretary is, if you are listening to me, Madam, can I tell you that if you can lay out a plan for next year for ASEAN-India relationship where we can have every event in every ASEAN country under AIBC to explore and see that how we link ourselves. And another request is we would like to link with all the states in India. Linking with all the states in India is very important for ASEAN. It is not only we link with Delhi, or with Maharashtra, we need to link with every state in India to see that ASEAN has got a linkage with every state in India to develop trade between India. These are few of my views. I humbly request that these views of mine are taken seriously. I've also spoken at the AEM in August with Minister Piyush Goyal, and we are actually working on the scoping for the ASEAN-India Free Trade Agreement, which is supposed to be reviewed 
AIBC is playing a very important and prominent role to see that things happen. And I hope that we can achieve what we are thinking. And the next move, what we are going to do is we are going to form an ASEAN India SME Council, which is an important council where we'll start linking SMEs together and also an ASEAN India Youth and Women Council, where we'll get the women and the youth linked together to see that our growth keeps on moving in the coming years. I think I've got only that to say. I've not prepared a text. This is all talk from my mind and my heart. I thank you all for listening to me, and I hope some of these points are taken so that we can move forward in the coming years. With that, thank you very much, Exim Bank. Thank you very much, AIC. My dear friend, Parveer is there. Thank you very much for inviting AIBC. I hope that we can work with more institutions in India to take this agenda forward. Thank you, Secretary, once again. Thank you very much, sir, for your enlightening speech on India and ASEAN long run relationship and the need to further strengthen our engagements going forward. May I now welcome Professor Sachin Chaturvedi, Director General, RIS, to deliver a special address. Over to you, sir. Um, uh, Honorable Secretary, uh, um, uh, Madam Riva Ganguly Das, uh, 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 Dato uh, um, uh, Shiramesh Kodamal, Co Chair ASEAN India Business Council, our very dear friend Ambassador Jane Kobagare, uh, um, uh, our uh, um, uh, Exim Bank colleagues, uh, Ms. Harsha Bangari, the Managing Director. Mr. David Sinate, my own colleague, uh, uh, Professor Praveer Day, but also very distinguished speakers from the next session, which is going to take the substantive agenda forward. I would very much like to acknowledge the uh, great presence of Dr. Uh, Relo from uh, area Jakarta and, uh, and also Professor uh, Rajan Ratna, uh, Professor Ruth uh, Man Myung, who, who has been contributing to this agenda profusely. And, uh, and also Secretary Carleto Gavez, who, who has been uh, uh, one of the major pushers in this uh, area, along with uh, uh, Mr. Mohammad Ishad, the head of the Corporate Affairs Party and uh, Tata Consulting Services. Friends, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, the stage is already set. Uh, uh, Dato has given the broad uh, roadmap, and I, I fully agree and endorse uh, several of his ideas, uh, which he has so uh, uh, profoundly articulated in in terms of uh, uh, linking with each state in India. And that I think that uh, 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 Kodamalji, I think, is an extremely important point that you have made. And, and this is the idea Secretary uh, uh, Madam Deva Ganguly Das has been talking about in terms of uh, ASEAN India Center establishing fellowships, connecting uh, scholars from each country at AIC and, and hosting them. And we are very, very happy that uh, on trade, investment, and other dimensions of our bilateral linkages, our collective partnership, that we take this forward and, and provide the kind of uh, uh, linkages that are uh, uh, that are important uh, that we should uh, uh, establish. You have also very rightly articulated the importance of uh, linkages between SMEs. I think that's the strength, that's the uh, 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 sort of uh, lifeline for uh, India-ASEAN partnership. Small and medium enterprises uh, is the reality. That's the uh, a fresh A for uh, uh, not only energizing our economies, but also providing the necessary bandwidth for our partnership. It's uh, SMEs that would take us forward in terms of uh, not only business to business connect, but they also strengthen people to people connect. It was this idea with which Prime Minister Modi announced uh, at Shangri-La Dialogue uh, uh, the idea of uh, FinTech Connect when his uh, emphasis was on financial technology and leveraging that for small and medium enterprises. The whole effort that India is unfolding under the leadership of the Prime Minister is to come out with the specific initiatives which are uh, laying out the roadmap uh, for development of technology and small enterprises. And that's the space uh, uh, which is uh, uh, being created. I must also use this opportunity to congratulate our colleagues from uh, Exim Bank, 
uh, for an excellent study, which uh, uh, we would be uh, launching very soon. I think uh, uh, ASEAN and India, as all of us agree, uh, they are bound together by, by their shared history. And, and they are also trying to bring forward uh, uh, the uh, transition that we are seeing from uh, uh, look east to act east and trying to bring out uh, some of those facts together where uh, more than 2 billion people with 5.6 trillion uh, uh, GDP that, that we are trying to see how they are going to dovetail uh, the larger efforts which are on. And, and these efforts are uh, largely evident through uh, the way we have dealt with COVID-19 crisis. The uh, idea is, uh, um, was very rightly uh, mentioned by uh, Dato uh, in terms of who our friends are and with whom partnerships are going to be reliable. I think you're absolutely right. Uh, the idea of, uh, of good ne uh, neighborliness, the idea of peaceful coexistence and prosperity in the region is part of the shared legacy that we have. And at ASEAN India Center at RIS, we have been trying to explore several of these dimensions together. ASEAN India Free Trade Agreement uh, and its review that you alluded to, uh, I think are some of the dimensions that are important in terms of uh, uh, contributing and taking that forward in terms of how we go forward and also trying to see uh, how this dimension can also be uh, addressed in terms of uh, retaking forward with, with full facts that more than 45% uh, of India's total exports to ASEAN and 50% of our imports from ASEAN are of intermediate products. And this is where value chain assumes great importance. I think uh, if you look at the sectors and my colleagues were uh, looking into this statistics very quickly, we found that uh, uh, the agro business and food processing pharma, automobiles, electronics, machinery, and medical enterprises. They are the ones which are uh, actually uh, uh, contributing in, uh, in a major way. And if you look at machinery or automobiles, they constitute almost 80% uh, of this uh, uh, intermediate product that are being imported uh, uh, under the uh, total imports from ASEAN. This shows our interdependence. This shows uh, the scope to strengthen value chains uh, among our partnership. And that, I think, uh, is extremely important for us uh, to go forward. As we all set in for uh, the 18th ASEAN India Summit, uh, which is going to be uh, in very soon, uh, next week itself, the, the, uh, the idea of uh, FTA and the value chain, I think, assumes great significance. I'm so glad that Exim Bank study has captured some of these details. And, and uh, I would very much like to emphasize here the methodology that we use. Uh, uh, the input output uh, uh, my reference framework is fine, but I think uh, uh, the end use of products uh, uh, is, is, uh, is something which is more reliable in terms of giving us uh, the bandwidth and the uh, reliable statistics uh, to take the whole concept and the uh, reliable uh, statistics forward that probably would give us more energy and more bandwidth to uh, to connect. I once again congratulate uh, uh, Ms. Harsha Bangari for her leadership and also for Exim Bank for accomplishing this study. I once again very warmly welcome uh, all the dignitaries and uh, of course our chief guest uh, uh, to this event. Thank you. Thank you very much sir for uh, highlighting the avenues for augmenting growth in the bilateral partnership between India and ASEAN in several dimensions for shared prosperity. It is now my privilege to welcome the Honorable Chief Guest for today's webinar, Ms. Riva Ganguly Das, Secretary East, Ministry of External Affairs, Government of India, to deliver the keynote address for this webinar. Excellencies, friends and colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, I'm delighted to join uh, you all here today at the inaugural session of this webinar on deepening India-ASEAN relations, exploring new avenues for engagements. Uh, I really commend the efforts of Exim Bank, ASEAN India Center and ASEAN India Business Council in organizing this very timely webinar. Uh, 
Uh, this is in run up to the forthcoming ASEAN India summit at the end of October 2021. Uh, we are in the midst of preparation for uh, this most important event in the annual ASEAN India calendar and the webinar today is a good opportunity for us to talk about the potential avenues for expanding uh, our cooperation. Uh, the tone has in a sense already been set with uh, very interesting suggestions which have been uh, made and um, I think uh, the uh, Exim Bank and uh, ASEAN India Center have the work cut out to put together all the recommendations and let us, the policymakers, know uh, how uh, we can, uh, you know, explore new and interesting areas of cooperation, which are, uh, you know, which uh, which give us quick results. We heard about linkages with Indian states. We heard about uh, linkages with Indian uh, business chambers, institutions, and the role of SMEs. All of these are very interesting ideas. And uh, I think um, as we, uh, we gear ourselves up to celebrate next year as the India ASEAN Friendship Year, we are marking next year as a very important anniversary. I think they, we've, uh, Exim Bank, I have no doubt, will be able to give us some interesting ideas for that. Uh, the pandemic uh, obviously provides the background uh, backdrop of how most countries approach both their economic policies and their global outlook right now. Uh, the last two years have bit witnessed a serious disruption in our supply chains, which have impacted our manufacturing, affected our trade, and ruined many services sectors. Uh, these developments have not just altered various dimensions of our day-to-day -day business, they've even shaped our way of life. The need for diversification of global value chain was felt acutely during the COVID period. Supply chain disruptions also raised natural concerns about long-term reliability and resilience. In many areas, it became apparent that the global economy was dangerously dependent on specific production centers. Even the world of services understood the consequences of over-reliance on limited resources. Whether it is tourism or travel, mobility or offshoring, the value of multiplicity was realized more than ever before. And consequently, there has been a greater emphasis on diversified and resilient supply chains. India's campaign for an Atmanirbhar Bharat or a self-reliant India resonates with our quest to become a democratic and trustworthy partner for global industrial resilience. It is important that India and ASEAN work towards global value chains that are diverse and put greater premium on trust and transparency, resilience and reliability, as also on choices and redundancy. As we talk about post-pandemic economic recovery, changes within societies are also important to recognize. Most societies have discovered the real potential of the digital in this process of recovery. Whether it was in terms of government or business or indeed education and health, the digital medium helped provide better and more effective solution. We have witnessed the critical role played by digital technologies during the COVID-19 wave. In keeping the supply chains open for an accelerated and sustainable economic recovery in the region. The strengthening of digital cooperation both with ASEAN and in the larger Indo-Pacific therefore acquires even greater importance. In this context, it is also important that we work together to address the digital gap. On its part, India has can offer its expertise in digitally inclusive programs like Bharat Net, Digital Village, Aspirational Districts, MyGov, and eKranti, and science and technology-based innovations to help the region as the scale and cost of our solution are indeed very attractive. Friends, the pandemic has also exposed lacunae in the global health system. Meaningful partnerships, sharing of advanced technologies, collaboration in vaccine and pharmaceutical production, capacity building, and transparency in health information are all part of the answers. India has made COVID and many other digital solutions which have played a key role in our public vaccination campaigns. Available freely, we made them available freely as open source software. Earlier this year, we shared our vaccine production with 95 countries, including ASEAN countries. And as trusted partners, the ASEAN countries have stood with India when we were going through our second wave of the pandemic. Uh, 
We have now resumed the export of vaccines. In addition, as announced by a prime minister at the 17th ASEAN India summit, India made a contribution of US dollar 1 million to the ASEAN COVID-19 response fund. We've also extended a contribution of US dollar 200,000 from ASEAN India Fund for ASEAN's humanitarian assistance to Myanmar. Cooperation in the field of health and pharma is another emerging area of focus for ASEAN India partnership. Friends, we in India and ASEAN countries have also been mindful of the environmental impact of our actions. India has strong record on climate change and has an ambitious vision, including for renewable and green hydrogen. There is great potential for cooperation between India and ASEAN for building a clean and green community. We have been working together through the ASEAN India Green Fund to support various activities and projects related to green, to climate change, energy efficiency, clean technologies, renewable energy, biodiversity con conservation, and environmental education. Sustainable development also lies at the heart of Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative and ASEAN Outlook on Indo-Pacific, which provides another avenue for strengthening ASEAN-India strategic partnership. Friends, enhancing our economic and trade cooperation will remain an area of focus as we enter the 30th year of India-ASEAN partnership in 2022. In 1992, India's total trade with ASEAN was less than 5 billion. And now in 30 years, ASEAN has become India's fourth largest trading partner. An important step for further enhancing our bilateral trade relations would be an early review of the ASEAN-India Trade in Goods Agreement, the ITGA. We are working with ASEAN to expedite the process with the objective to make the agreement trade facilitative, user-friendly, with contemporary and streamlined customs and regulatory uh, procedures. Connectivity is a vital area which directly affects the pace of trade and economic relations between our two sides. ASEAN and India share land and maritime borders, and there is great potential for enhancing connectivity through land, air, and the sea. We envision connectivity with the region in very broad terms, including physical, economic, and people-to-people -people connectivity. These connectivity projects offer a great opportunity for our trade and business community. Friends, India's ties with the ASEAN are rooted in history, geography, and culture. What has energized them in recent years is a growing awareness of the potential they hold for our mutual interests and development. While the pandemic has posed unprecedented challenges, it has opened new vistas for ASEAN-India cooperation. In the post-pandemic period, India and the ASEAN countries are poised to further strengthen our strategic partnership by exploring new avenues. Today, India's engagement with ASEAN is driven by our common priorities of bringing peace, stability, and prosperity to the region. ASEAN is central to India's ACTIS policy, and our ties are a source of balance and harmony in the region. In these difficult times of global challenges, such as the pandemic and economic uncertainties, our excellent and multifaceted strategic partnership is a bright spot of optimism. I hope that the discussions today will generate new ideas for taking forward the ASEAN-India strategic partnership. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam, for your thought-provoking speech and the important roadmap as to how India and ASEAN could follow going forward, including harnessing potential that exists for further cooperation in key sectors. Uh, at this point, I would also like to acknowledge uh, the presence of His Excellency, Mr. Jayant uh, and Cobra Gade, India's ambassador to ASEAN for joining us uh, in uh, today's webinar. Uh, now I would request the honorable chief guest to kindly release India Exim Bank's in-house research publication, Building Value Chain Opportunities for India and ASEAN. I also request the other inaugural speakers to kindly join the chief guests in releasing the publication and hold the cover page in front of the screen. A photo screenshot will be taken to capture the release for our record. Just hold.
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for those who are interested, a copy of the publication is being made available uh, for download at Exim Bank's India's website at the publications section uh, under the research publication. Yes, uh, now, yeah, this is the publication. Yes, now uh, we will now continue with the panel discussion session in which uh, experts will uh, deliberate upon the theme of uh, today's event. So uh, without much further ado, allow me to introduce the chair, uh, Dr. Prabir Deh, professor and head, ASEAN India Center, RIS, New Delhi. Dr. Rajan Ratna, deputy head and senior economic affairs officer, UNESCAP, New Delhi. Professor Ruth Banomyang, Dean, Tamasat Business School, Masad University, Bangkok. Secretary Carlito D. Galvez, Jr., Office of the Presidential Advisor on the Peace Process, Vaccine Czar and Chief Implementer, National Task Force Against COVID-19, Government of the Philippines. Dr. Teodoro J. Harbosa, MD, Special Advisor, National Task Force Against COVID-19, Government of the Philippines. And Mr. Mohammed Yushak, Head of Corporate Affairs for ASEAN, Tata Consultancy Services, Asia Pacific, Singapore. Over to you, Professor Dan. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Fanai and uh, um, Chairman Jefferson, uh, Exim Bank, uh, Madam Has Bangari, uh, for this panel discussion, and uh, my co panelists uh, here, Dr. Rapna. Uh, Mr. Carlos Galvez, uh, uh, Mr. Theodore Harboza, Dr. Harboza, Mr. Uh, Irsad, uh, and of course, uh, Ruth Banomion. So, and I can see uh, other Exim Bank colleagues, uh, David, and many others who are listening and watching us through uh, in a live session. So, welcome to the panel discussion. And as we have seen, there is a you know, great amount of uh, enthusiasm in this uh, whole discussion today and a great speech uh, delivered by our all dignitaries in the morning. Um, Secretary East, uh, Madam Reva Ganguly Dash, uh, Chairperson's Exim Bank, and um, Professor Sachin Chaturvedi, Director General of RIS, and Dato Ramos from AIBC. So four speeches, they all talked about deeper cooperation. That's what uh, we can, I can see, and I can just make a, a connecting point, um, connecting point for all four, which is that they all ask for a deeper cooperation in, in, in ASEAN and India relations. And the title is the Deepening India-ASEAN Relations, Exploring New Avenues for Engagement in the panel. Uh, my uh, chair, Dr. Aladdin D. Rilo, uh, he could not join. Uh, Today morning, he uh, intimated to us that he is not feeling well. He should be excused. So I took this opportunity to just do a moderating and watching my, you know, watching the time and remind you that this is the time. Time is up for you, and and I can call upon the other other speakers for sub themes. You know, we have identified in this uh, panel. One is on trade investment and and value chain. Uh, I don't need to introduce Dr. Rapna. He is he's an authority on the subject. He's a he is a member of India ASEAN FTA negotiations. And so he will be sharing his own insights and narratives that he has on value chain investment and trade. Then we have infrastructure and connectivity. Uh, Professor Banomio is himself is an, another authority for connectivity and, and infrastructure in ASEAN, as well as you know, ASEAN dialogue partners, including China and India. And he has a hands-on experience in dealing with several projects. So of course, we will be seeking his his, his uh, views on ASEAN India, you know, particularly on the connectivity infrastructure side. Then I come to uh, Secretary uh, Galvez, and um, and uh, he's his deputy and his ad consultant, his advisor, uh, Dr. Harbosa. He's also here. We also listen to him. Um, Secretary Galvez is implementing as a presidential advisor, peace process and chief implementer and vaccine czar. Uh, of National Task Force on COVID-19. So he has a good amount of 
hands-on experience in handling the COVID-19 scenario situation in, in the Philippines. Also, he will say from his own, uh, the implications for India, ASEAN and India-Philippines and their relations on, 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 on vaccine and health and, and, and cooperations. And finally, uh, we'll come to digital infrastructure sector. Digital infrastructure, as you know, uh, this is very important, particularly this time when we are working from home, we are connected more digitally than physically. So uh, the India is one of the top uh, rated high companies called India Consulting Services, Asia Pacific in charge on the corporate affairs for ASEAN, Mohammad Irsa, his experience and dealing with digital infrastructure. So these are four uh, important areas we have highlighted. So let me first come to uh, Dr. Ratna. Um, time is about eight to 10 minutes. And then, you know, if we have more time, I'll come back to you once again. Please uh, let me know, you know, and please share us, share with us your views, your perspective on, on the theme that's India ASEAN relations from the point of view of India, uh, trade investment and value chain. Uh, Dr. Ratna, Professor Ratna, what to you? Uh, uh, thank you, Professor Prabir uh, Day. And uh, let me also thank Exit Bank and RIS for uh, hosting this event and giving me this opportunity. Uh, yes, it always takes back to the memory when we were negotiating and engaged when I was in the government of India with ASEAN some 20 years ago. Uh, and uh, I start with the fact that when we were doing, there was a joint study being done between India and ASEAN, and they used the CD modeling way back in 2000. And they said that uh, as per the modeling, uh, if there is an FTA, there would be a $12 billion worth of uh, additional trade which will be generated. And that would be in the ratio of one is to four. That means India will gain something around $2.5 uh, billion. And uh, ASEAN will have uh, a remaining 9.5. But uh, we started actually negotiating in 2003 and 4. And by 2005, we already surpassed $20 billion of good without even an FTA. And in 2010, when 2009 it started, which touched something around $45 billion of trade bilaterally. So, uh, uh, and it also identified several sectors where there is at that moment of time, 2000, 2001, there was no concept of value chain, but it did identify areas where, uh, uh, you know, win-win situation exists. And as uh, 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 Professor Sachin told, and the Secretary East and Dr. Prabir Day is talking about the ICT connectivity. At that moment of time, India was known for software, ASEAN was known for hardware, and it was, uh, you know, when we were discussing, even at a ministerial level, we were talking about, oh, there is a existing complementarities, and we can do. Uh, 20 years down the line, I leave it to uh, most of the academicians to really see whether that integration has actually happened between India and ASEAN or not. There are several problems and challenges, but the good thing in goods, if you see, uh, the trade has increased. Of course, there are issues on balance of uh, payment related issues with one country or other country. But if you go back and look at the CGE, when one country gets engaged with 10 countries as a group, definitely it will face uh, adverse balance of trade. But the good part is what Professor Sachin Tathurvedi said, and I also did analysis and found that uh, both sides started exporting more composition of the capital goods, the consumer goods to each other. Uh, uh, and intermediate goods and that link to each other through the value chain. Uh, the other thing which in goods I would like to say is I did quick analysis very recently for one of my friends who is an ambassador in ASEAN. Uh, the Indian PM's call of uh, you know uh, rising the export and uh, so the Commerce Secretary wrote to all the ambassadors about how you can promote export but it's a two-way process and I did a quick analysis and I found that the countries in ASEAN are importing certain items um, uh, in huge quantity. That means there is a market and India also is exporting to the world and, and, and the trade volume globally is much, much high, but they are not trading bilaterally. And the same is true. India is also importing from the rest of the world and ASEAN also is exporting to the rest of the world. That means both of them have global competitiveness, but they are not exporting to each other. Their share is 1%, 2%, 3%, 4% of the global they import. Now that speaks that something uh, is missing in the implementation of FTA when in 2013, everything became zero. Of course, with Philippines, it will be 2023, but 
there, there are issues, there are challenges, and some of the challenges could be, uh, Dr. Professor Prabhu is also one of the experts, issues relating to trade facilitation, the trade cost between India and ASEAN is still very high, the border check post, the infrastructure is not very good, the transport linkages are very, very weak, if you have to export from Mumbai to, uh, to Thailand or somewhere, you cannot take it by road, you have to take it by ship, um, road connectivity, rail connectivity, though we had, these are the challenges. Investments, uh, some took place immediately after, uh, uh, you know, the FDA, but uh, that was also not very, very forthcoming. And so the forward backward linkage of the investment and the industries is still lacking. Uh, services trade, I mean, uh, yes, I do understand. Uh, it, it faced a lot of challenges in terms of negotiating between the two parties. There was always apprehension. Uh, uh, that the other party will sweep uh, the market and flood the market as it was India's concern in goods uh, was services concern in, in, in ASEAN. But if you are really looking for a comprehensive economic partnership, unless all these three components are topped with each other, because one supplements other, in manufacturing also there is a concept of servicification. There are a lot of services input which go into it. Unless you really reap into those kind of benefits, uh, the integration will not happen. Of course, the value chain is there, the intra-industry trade is there, but uh, there are certain connectivity related issues. And the second which I liked was the, the Secretary East when she was talking about a COVID. Uh, if you look at framework, the framework has a special chapter on economic cooperation. Post-COVID, what we did, how many times did we exchange our experiences with India and ASEAN? We stopped. We, I mean, India and border, the Myanmar have a border. We closed. SARC closed the border. ASEAN closed the border. I mean, uh, when you are talking about a comprehensive economic partnership and with 20 years of engagement, if we are still reacting with a knee-jerk reaction and we are not... Uh, uh, you know, sharing, I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about uh, sharing or exporting the vaccine or importing the vaccine or a PPT kit. I'm all talking about how to stop the pandemic and what are the best practices which a country has followed in stopping it. If that could have been uh, also initiated immediately after that, perhaps things worldwide would have been better. But uh, I saw it's not only between India and ASEAN, it's in uh, SARC, it's in ASEAN, it's between SARC and ASEAN, it's in DIMSTEC, you name it, and each grouping, it's all focusing on how I can export, 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 export. That is not is a comprehensive economic partnership. I thank you, Praveer. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ratna. I mean, I have a subsidiary questions to each uh, speaker here. That 18th summit next week, so very very quickly, can you tell uh, three recommendations? Maybe these are not going to feed into summit discussion. But certainly, you know, would like to see, you know, what is it you have, you know, and what you'd like to recommend for our leaders. So three recommendations from your side um, on ASEAN India partnerships in, in terms of trade uh, investment and value chain. Uh, I would recommend the first would be how to reduce the trade cost between the countries and their uh, trade facilitation efforts, paperless regime, uh, lesser documentation, uh, those kind of arrangements are essential. Uh, the second, it needs to be topped up with the transport linkage and especially given that uh, India and ASEAN have a common border, uh, it would be good to have a good connectivity of the road. Uh, because unless, I mean, you have to take, even by ship, it takes a lot of time. And nowadays, after COVID, the, the container costs have tripled as per the fuel estimates. So uh, it, that is uh, the second one. And third one I would find is, we need to go beyond conventional goods, services, and investment and look at seriously at those economic cooperation chapters. How many times India or how many products India and ASEAN have entered into a mutual recognition agreement on certain products? India and ASEAN in 20 years of FTA harmonized or recognized any international standard among themselves by reducing the trade cost? The answer is no. 
now unless today it's not a pricing today it's not uh, you know uh, a real value chain these soft issues are more important which drive the direction of trade investment and value chains thank you very much no thank you the point number three is very important and which is your core area uh, but by the way we haven't had much opportunity to have a discussion on those uh, but certainly you know uh, you have raised three important points and i'm sure this is going to get a space and uh, knowingly or unknowingly in the in the discussion summit process so thank you very much uh, professor ratna please uh, wait uh, we will come back to the second round next uh, speaker uh, professor ruth banomyong uh, he is a trade expert so professor banomyong floor is yours uh, in 8 to 10 minutes time you have been dealing india asian connectivity you have been dealing at a farm level at a national level you are also a theoretician you are also presenting on logistics which is simply different than connectivity which is more into political items so what do you like to tell us you know on uh, asean india connectivity and infrastructure and three recommendations to you know i would also request you to give us for three our recommendations leaders. okay yes. okay thank you very much please okay thank you thank you uh, chair and uh, first of all good afternoon good evening to to everyone joining this uh, particular panel uh, i have been asked to 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 try to look at uh, india asean from the perspective of infrastructure and connectivity i think my my first remark will be you know how how do you actually uh, understand this concept of connectivity because it has become i would say a very big buzzword and with the advent of the pandemic it seems like this connectivity concept also has been disrupted because a lot of the supply chains basically have, have broken down, be it because of uh, insufficient uh, transport capability, capacity, be it because of national uh, legislation related to uh, health. Uh, we, we do see that uh, connectivity can have, in fact, very, very uh, different meaning if we do not scope it adequately. So. Uh, before I start and talk about India ASEAN, allow me just to to, to talk a bit about the, the framework for 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 connectivity. Uh, we tend to think when we uh, discuss connectivity, uh, one of the first things that we we tend to discuss is the infrastructure. And of course, I think uh, my my colleagues were, were were stating a few moments ago, like for example, this issue of land connectivity between. Uh, India and ASEAN with the border uh, uh, with Myanmar that creates in fact uh, a closeness uh, that will should enable better connectivity then we also need to look at air connectivity maritime connectivity uh, at the moment there is no rail connectivity yet and maybe this is something that could be done for the long term and uh, last but not the least, which I think another panelist will, will expand even more, it is the digital connectivity. But focusing on infrastructure, I would say that, yes, it is important. It is a qualifier, but it is not sufficient. In fact, for me, uh, infrastructure has never been a problem as long as you had the money to build that infrastructure. And I think that that message is important because infrastructure requires a lot of investment and the question that is quite often asked is you know where do we get the money for infrastructure but i would also like which is what we call the soft infrastructure and this is where the soft infrastructure plays a very important role in enabling uh connectivity why because soft infrastructure relates to for example uh regulations regulations and we were talking a few moments ago about this uh, closeness physical closeness between india and asean but the reality is we are not close at all there are a number of regulatory barriers that in fact increases the distance between india and asean we also have this issue of institutions because even though India is dealing with ASEAN, but within ASEAN itself, all the 10 members also have different type of institutions in terms of dealing with connectivity. Uh, there, there is no sole authority 
in ASEAN or in the various ASEAN member states that has authority over uh, the whole spectrum of connectivity. So this is something that, that, that creates even more challenges. And we must not forget uh, in terms of the soft infrastructure, the, the human resources. And I think maybe my, my first recommendation is that if we want to enable connectivity, be it infrastructure regulate or regulatory or soft infrastructure, I think the first thing that we need to be able to connect are the people. So uh, my first recommendation would probably be uh, no more visas between ASEAN nationals and Indian uh, nationals. I think that would be the first thing that, that would need to be done. Uh, and that, that is probably the easiest thing uh, to do. But if we look in more details in terms of the concrete uh, types of connectivity, uh, probably the most famous one is uh, for, for, for the land connectivity is this India, Myanmar, Thailand uh, trilateral highway, which connects these three countries from, I think, Moray in India to Mesot in Thailand, and now there are extension through Laos to Vietnam, extension uh, even through Cambodia. I, I just had a, a few moments before the, uh, the webinar, and I tried to look on Google Map and use Google Map to say, I want to travel from Bangkok to Delhi, and how much or how long will it take me? So in total, Google Map calculated that it was about 4,500 uh, kilometers from Bangkok to Delhi. But what surprised me the most was it said to me, if I was driving a car, that it would take me 70 hours, so basically uh, three days. But as we know, Google doesn't know uh, about uh, the quality of the road. Google doesn't know about the regulation for a car to go across a country, what type of insurance is needed. And Google doesn't also know about the challenge in crossing the borders. So it's a theoretical number, which I find very interesting is that you can, in fact, theoretically link uh, Delhi and Bangkok in three days. Uh, I think that would be a very best case scenario, but I think that is something that is very interesting because that means that there's a lot of potential for it. Of course, from an infrastructure side, things are moving very quickly, but from a soft infrastructure perspective, in term, especially in terms of the agreement for vehicles to go across, there's still some challenges because uh, Thailand, Myanmar are part of the, also the greater Mekong sub-region. They follow a certain uh, region agreement called the Cross-Border Transport Agreement, whereas India would like to propose uh, the, motor the Motor Vehicle Act. So again, I think there's a lot of uh, harmonization that, that, needs to, that needs to be done between both ASEAN and India, especially from a regulatory perspective, uh, for, 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 for the connectivity to be able to, uh, to, to occur. And, and I think this is just a representative example of the potential from a physical perspective. When you use an, alg an algorithm, it says, yes, you can do it in 72 hours, but if a truck was actually going to go from Bangkok to Delhi, how long would it take? Probably at least seven to 10 days. And we're not even talking about the challenges that we have at the moment in Myanmar. Another very interesting uh, project is the uh, Multimodal Transit Corridor project. And again, it's about to help link with the uh, Eastern states uh, in, in India going through uh, Myanmar. But again, we, we were faced with challenges because the, the, the regime for multimodal transport is not there yet, even though Myanmar has uh, is a signatory to the ASEAN Framework Agreement on Multimodal Transport, but there is no multimodal transport agreement between India and ASEAN. So that would be my second uh, recommendation. And uh, last but not the least, uh, when, when we look at uh, connectivity, I know it is very important to not forget air connectivity. And yes, we have the ASEAN India Air Transport uh, agreement for that. But on, on that sense, probably ASEAN has been uh, dragging its feet uh, a bit in terms of the opening of the various freedom, especially in terms of the full 
the various freedom. And I think this is where my third recommendation will come in is to really fully liberalize, uh, not, not just sign and have an agreement, but actually implement and fully liberalize the ASEAN India uh, air transport uh, agreement. So I think for the first round, this is what I wanted to share. And, and just to recap my three recommendations. So one, no more visa for uh, nationals between India and ASEAN. Second recommendation is harmonization of regulation and by using the multimodal transport agreement as an example, because also India has its own multimodal transport uh, legislation. So that needs to be harmonized. And third, full implementation of the uh, Air India Air Transport uh, Agreement. Thank you, Pravya. Thank you very much. These three are very important bonding issues in, between India and ASEAN, and these are there for many years. And uh, you have been contributing to some of them directly through your writing and to your uh, presentations time to time. So thank you very much, uh, Ruth, for an excellent presentation and the frank discussion. So kindly continue to stay. We will come back to you second uh, second half, uh, second part of the discussion, if time permits. Let me come to the third speaker, uh, and uh, Secretary uh, Galvez. Um, welcome to uh, the panel. And uh, Excellency, please, uh, uh, floor is yours. And please share with us your experience in dealing COVID-19 situation in Philippines, implications for India, ASEAN, and what you like to have between India and Philippines in terms of bringing the countries together in and, and, and dealing with the challenges in the COVID and post-COVID uh, period. And also we have your um, your advisor, uh, Dr. Herbosa. We'll come back to him, uh, you know, for with subsidiary questions. Please, three recommendations. Don't forget to our leaders. Thank you. Over to you. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Dr. Pra Prabir, uh, Professor Prabir, uh, our distinguished uh, panelists, uh, our organizers, uh, uh, my courtesies to all. I am deeply honored to join you, uh, the highly esteemed members of the ASEAN and Indian business community in this webinar. I congratulate uh, the India ASEAN Bank, the ASEAN India Business Council, and the ASEAN India Center at RIS for spearheading this uh, initiative that uh, aims to boost the trade and investment between ASEAN countries and India. This gathering is crucial and timely as the international business community finds a creative ways to accelerate its recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. Recognized as the pharmacy of the world, India was one of the first countries we wanted to approach for help. When the health crisis struck last year and over the years, India's booming pharmaceutical industry has been a reliable source of life-saving medicines and vaccine from, for, for the Philippines and other ASEAN countries, and also countries throughout the globe. That is why we were optimistic that COVID-19 vaccines, which at time were still in their development stage, would soon be available in India. Among the, the key factors we considered during our exploratory negotiations with various vaccine manufacturers were their production capacity, and more importantly, the availability of their vaccine supplies, particularly in India. As we were in the race against time, we were considering the possibility of sourcing vaccines not just from manufacturing plants located in the ASEAN region, but also those based in India, considering that India produces a COVID shield, co vaccines, and also the Novavax, which we knew were made of a very high quality. My colleagues and I in the National Task Force Against COVID-19 were therefore very excited when our visit to India early this year was true. It was a very productive and informative visit for all of us, especially in seeing firsthand how India manufactured its vaccines. At the same time, learning from the best practices of countries, of experts, and pharmaceutical industry. While our visit primarily aimed to secure the COVID-19 vaccine for our country, we were also considering the possibility of establishing partnership with India that would develop the Philippines' capacity and self-sufficiency in producing its own medicine and vaccine requirements. What we saw during our visit to India convinced us to be more aggressive in developing the Philippine healthcare system because we saw the India's perfect healthcare system and your, your, your system is very, very excellent. And uh, during the time, uh, the, you know, the ambassador of India 
uh, told me that uh, you are a very very uh, perfect healthcare system. You are not your your uh, your uh, uh, proced procedures medical procedures very cheap as compared to us, your excellencies. Uh, that's why many Filipinos who have um, a very you know very chronic diseases go to India to have the operations. So uh, we were very encouraged uh, by that visit, and in formulating our healthcare policies, we you know we direct, we we, uh, we asked the Congress to pass our healthcare system, meaning we you know we we requested the Congress and the Senate to pass the uh, Health Security Act, which we you know we we you know we we envision to have uh, like uh, like uh, in India, as well as in the implementation of the country's national vaccination program. India is one of the best. Uh, model in the vaccination program considering that uh, you have vaccinated almost uh, me as many as uh, population that you had and i believe now you are now the, the most uh, um uh great model for how we could uh, vaccinate uh, millions of people in a day india is among the Asian top trading partners and the philippine 14 trading partner and i believe that as a global health situation continues to improve in the coming months Trade and investment between the region and India, as well as between India and the Philippines, will gain momentum and significant increase. There are many avenues for partnership that can be explored between ASEAN member states and India, particularly in the healthcare and medicine and pharmaceutical sectors. The key to our success in this joint effort is to identify areas for complementation and collaboration that will capitalize on each of our country's strengths. On the part of the Philippines, our goal is to enhance our healthcare system while developing our country's capacity to produce our own medicines and vaccines. As we speak, our Department of Trade and Industry has been exploring the possibility of forging a partnership with India to produce active pharmaceutical ingredients or APIs, vaccines, and the essential medicines and biologicals. Another opportunity that we are looking into is for the Philippines to serve as a research and development hub for pharmaceuticals, for pharmaceuticals, with our highly skilled medical professionals, and we believe that our country has the capacity to take on this role with the support coming from other ASEAN neighbors in India. And we, we are now exploring for an India-Philippines uh, exchange uh, visits and uh, exploration. Amidst, amidst the pandemic, there are a lot of economic opportunities that we can continue to explore and in due time formalize, formalize them. All we have to do is to recognize and capitalize on each other's strength so that we can achieve our full potentials as trading partners. With various industries uh, represented here today, may this webinar serve as an, uh, a venue wherein we can build stronger partnership, and strengthen our respective countries' role in the global trading arena, and enable the ASEAN and our partner countries, such as India, to rebuild and recover faster from this health crisis. As the saying goes, a rising tide lift all boats. Let us be the tide that will help us rise above the, this pandemic. Again, thank you very much to the organizers of this event for inviting me to this forum. And let, let us continue to support, collaborate, and work together and to build back better, stronger, and more resilient ASEAN with India as our reliable partner. Uh, Dr. Prabir, we would like to convey uh, the message of our president that uh, he believes that India plays an important part in the ASEAN role in this pandemic. And we believe on the vision of uh, Prime Minister Modi. Dr. Prabir, over to you. Thank, Thank, you, very, thank you very much, uh, Secretary Galvez, for an excellent overview and your experience and also recognizing India as one of the partners for Philippines in meeting with the challenges and uh, hopefully we would have you know more discussions and as you said that you'd like to have an exchange visits uh, so hopefully we will have more discussion on that and i personally would be interested to be part of the team you know who will be working and um and you know if you need any further interactions please feel free to come back to us and um thank you very much once again uh, for your presentations and we have some queries i would come back to you uh, to your colleague um, dr arboza soon soon after you know i i complete the round table uh, the next speaker is now on the digital infrastructure uh, mr mohammad irsad who is the head of corporate affairs for asian in tcs so um, mr arsad floor is yours 
so eight to ten minutes and please don't forget to give three recommendations for our leaders for the ASEAN India summit to be held next week over to you absolutely thank you thank you professor Prabir and a warm welcome to one and all who have joined this particular panel discussion to my distinguished panelists ladies and gentlemen my deepest appreciation to the India Exim Bank, ASEAN India Business Council, ASEAN India Centre at RS, RIS. It is my pleasure to join you today at this timely webinar that seeks to deepen the India-ASEAN relations in exploring new avenues of engagement. And as mentioned, in the next eight to 10 minutes that I have, allow me to focus a bit on the digital infrastructure and some of the growth opportunities that ASEAN presents. All right, so, a lot has been focused on the physical infrastructure. I think digital infrastructure is a bridge that, you know, that we can act on in the immediate future. The rise of ASEAN's digital economy has a number of key characteristics. A growing population of internet and mobile phone users, region-wide digital in initiatives to increase connectivity between markets, the rapid acceleration of digitalization across practically all aspects of the economy. Together, these factors signal the business potential linked to the digital integration of the region, which is estimated to generate an additional US $1 trillion in GDP by 2025. And focusing on three areas, as Professor Prabhu mentioned, the first is digital services are trending up. Although a trend that has started before COVID-19, the pandemic in fact has accelerated end user engagement with digital services in ASEAN by as much as 50%, depending on the market that you're talking about in ASEAN. E-commerce has grown significantly, as well as e-education, e-banking, e-health, and e-government services. And the dynamism around digital services is being driven in large part by a rising number of internet users in the region. And in 2020, last year alone, there were 40 million new users, reinforcing the expectation that the internet sector in ASEAN will grow from the current US 100 billion in GMV to USD 300 billion by 2025. And highlighting the impact on e-commerce, one of the large e-commerce players in ASEAN explained how this rapid transition has happened in Indonesia, whereby that particular e-commerce platform took a decade to grow to 6 million merchants. But in 2020, last year alone, at the height of the pandemic, that merchant count grew to 11 million merchants on the platform. So it's almost doubled just in the last year alone as a result of post-COVID-19. And the second point that I would like to uh, mention and to highlight is digitalization presents new growth opportunities. For international businesses, particularly Indian businesses that are interested in ASEAN, it is necessary to grasp how widespread the trend of digitalization has become around the region. Initiatives such as Go Digital ASEAN, digital skills to address the economic impact of COVID-19, the ASEAN Digital Integration Framework have been designed to enable all businesses, including micro, small, and medium enterprises, which account for at least 88% of all establishment in the region, to participate in the digital economy and to enjoy its benefits. The adoption of digital payment solution has been key in this regard by allowing merchants to reach previously untapped customer groups and engage more easily cross-border e-commerce. Digital wallets are also enabling new customer groups to join the market. And in this regard, I welcome to see many of the regional ASEAN players integrating with the Indian UPI uh, payment gateway for easier cross-border transaction. And putting these changes into perspective, in a case study of another e-commerce player in ASEAN, where in 20, 2012, most people uh, and, and that particular e-commerce player reported that in 2012 most people didn't even have mobile wallets and 70 percent of the, that particular platform's transaction was done through desktop but fast forward looking at 2021 which is this year mobile apps now account and make up 90 percent of the transaction on that particular platform another important element of e-commerce in ASEAN is personalization Research has found that over 9 in 10 consumers are more likely to shop with brands who provide relevant offers and recommendations, while 80% are willing to share their data to receive such an experience. And this is important because the e-commerce market in India is very established and you know, very advanced. 
So there are definitely opportunities for such integration at digital level across ASEAN and in India. On such platform, data is being used to ensure a given customer is both aware of what product others are purchasing, social proof being an important motivator for ASEAN buyers, and receiving personalized product recommendation based on the preferences. The third point uh, that I want to mention is big data is linking ASEAN's local ecosystems. A key consequence of ASEAN's increasingly connected consumer base is the need for cross-border services to support the buying and selling of goods across the region. And businesses have responded by accelerating the digital transformation to, adopt, to adapt to the fast-changing consumption landscape. Big data, AI, and other advanced technologies are playing an important and crucial role in this process, helping businesses to improve the efficiency, make better business decisions. They're also enabling businesses of all sizes in ASEAN to find their place in the global value chain and access new markets. And in the logistics sector, robotics, predictive analytics, have ensured that these supply chains are able to accommodate the rise in the demand of e-commerce and rise in demand of logistics. The message to Indian companies is quite clear. Not to try to do everything themselves if they're venturing to ASEAN, rather to partner with local provider and local supplier to allow you to focus on your core international competency as you expand out of India to look at ASEAN as a potential market for it to expand to. Big data, AI are being applied to a wide range of users, including price comparison, supply demand prediction, inventory management. And as the region becomes increasingly connected and the number of internet users continue to rise, using big data effectively will be an imperative for business to stay competitive. Last but not least, as businesses look for opportunities to thrive in ASEAN's growing digital economy, foreign investment is both welcome and needed. Governments across ASEAN are supporting a digitalization agenda that features important incentives for seeking inroad into their markets. Pair this with developments with the double-digit growth of Indonesia's digital economy having originated 70%, almost about 5.47 billion of all digital investment in Southeast Asia, between 2020 and 2021 and the market is an important destination for international businesses interested in the region another country is vietnam where digital economy is growing very rapidly and is developing at a 2030 fdi mobilization strategy focused on the technology and related sectors the strategy is envisioned to complement existing industry 4.0 related initiative such as the building of an innovation center in Hanoi to attract foreign and domestic investments. If you look at Thailand, this encouraging investments in the building of data centers and cloud computing capabilities to support the digital transformation of businesses in the country. The government is also providing tax incentive and streamlined entry for skilled personnel in the technology sector through the Smart Visa program. And these are just some of the many opportunities that rise out of the ASEAN digital economy that it presents. A range of sectors from logistics to retail to manufacturing will all require significant digital investments over the coming years. And this offers tremendous potential for deepening economic ties on the digital front between India and ASEAN. And with that, I would like to hand back to the moderator, Professor Prabhu, please. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Arsad, for, uh, for an excellent speech and the presentation. You have created so many points, you know, and I have taken a note, even though I'm not an expert and domain knowledge expert on the subjects, but I think uh, these are uh, the important uh, points like big data analysis or artificial intelligence, robotics, uh, application of robotics and logistics. So thank you very much. And I'm sure the ASEAN countries, uh, they have been taking lots of interest, having a consultation with TCS and other Indian companies who are doing business in, in uh, ASEAN markets. But to, to my mind, uh, one subsidiary question comes that, you know, in ASEAN 10 countries, while you have, you are located in Singapore, where the digital payments, uh, you know, almost, uh, it's just a kind of a mandatory uh, for anything. But whereas you have your other side, the Myanmar, Cambodia, Liberia, Vietnam. So there's still uh, many people that don't have the smartphone with them. The disparity is so wide, but this also gives an opportunity to catch up with Singapore. So that's what, uh, you know, ASEAN is a very vibrant regional, uh, you know, regional organizations, you know, 
while there is always this, you know, PR is coming to everybody's mind. So how how do you look at it? This kind of you know, kind of a wide spectrum in, in terms of you know the, the catching up scenarios, particularly in the in the digital system. Over to you, ma'am. Yeah. Professor Prabir, I think it's a wonderful, excellent question. And that, that question in itself answers itself in, in my perspective because it offers tremendous potential in ASEAN as a region. As you said, as a region, there are 10 countries as part of ASEAN. And each of the countries' economic growth is at various stages. Uh, Singapore is well in advance, but it's a small market. You know, it's a small market with a population of 6 million or so. And you have countries like Indonesia where its population exceeds 200 million and you have countries like Malaysia, 60, over 60 million, and Philippines likewise in big numbers. And that is the beauty of ASEAN itself because each country have their own unique uh, positioning, have its unique uh, something to offer to the ASEAN uh, you know, platform, whereby many countries, although they are operating in Indonesia, although they're operating in, in, in Malaysia or Philippines and so on, they have a base in Singapore where they have access to capital markets with access to many VCs, venture capital companies, private equity players, and it's a financial hub, they have easy access to uh, liquidity and, 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 and access to money. So in a sense, although they are looking at an ASEAN perspective, they choose to be located in Singapore, and at the same time, they also have presence in other ASEAN countries where they have tremendous potential to grow because of the large volume of user base that they have in, in that particular country. So I think the way I would see and approach a question is the kind of potential that ASEAN offers. Because if you have all advanced economies, there's lesser potential to grow. When you have economies at growing stages, especially nascent economy that are coming up, and what you have is an opportunity for companies which are looking to move to and capitalize on the growing ASEAN market to then expand and grow along with the, the growth trajectory of ASEAN itself. Thank you very much, thank you. Let me come to the our final speaker, uh, Dr. Harbosa. Uh, Dr. Harbosa, uh, please uh, tell us uh, your own views and frank opinion about India-Philippines uh, on the health sector, the cooperation particularly in the, in the, in the Philippines health sector. You have been assisting the Philippines government in implementing you know, COVID-related programs and uh, you know, action plans. So please, over to you in one or two minutes time. Then we can come back to other speakers you know, we have some about 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 15 minutes time in hand for thank, Q and thank A you very much. and wrapping up. Thank you very much, Professor Pravir, and uh, thank you to all the esteemed speakers. Uh, well, uh, Secretary Galvez has told you the trajectory of what the Philippines is going to do in terms of strengthening its health system, and I'd like to take off from there. What we've learned from the COVID uh, pandemic was it exposed the weaknesses of our health system. And I think what is clear is that we've had long relations with India. Many uh, students of India come to the Philippines to study uh, medicine. And uh, many of them are, I think, uh, returned, have already returned and graduated. But during the COVID pandemic, this has uh, suffered because of the uh, difficulties of travel. What I'd like to really emphasize is that uh, I think uh, for exchange in the health systems to happen, we have to understand the uh, social determinants of the health system. Uh, different countries, the ASEAN, have different health systems. Uh, so, so is India. And I think what is important are the different bases in where we can cooperate. One is in economic uh, stability, wherein we can now continue to have exchange. We've had parallel imports of medicines that have been happening even uh, way back in the past two decades, which has helped the Philippines lower its price of medicines and equipment. Uh, another important part is really the... Uh, education exchange, and it was mentioned by many of the speakers before me, uh, in terms of scientific research, exchange of the academia, professors and students, so that there will be continued growth between our two regions, India and the ASEAN region. Uh, next is really a very important part is about the uh, community and cultural uh, exchange that happens. Uh, it, of course, you may want economic activity, but the cultural activity and the cultural exchange needs to happen very well. And lastly, I think the health system that uh, uh, Secretary Galvez talked about is very important. Uh, India has been able to create a health system that, that would provide uh, direction towards universal health coverage. The Philippines is the same, so is our ASEAN neighbors who are trying to attain a healthcare system 
that will uh, cover everyone, 100% of the people, that will be provide accessibility. And you heard our speakers talk about the digital health and how, <clears throat> how digital technology has helped economics. Digital health will also be able to allow uh, remote areas of our countries be able to access healthcare. Uh, with this, I think the beauty will be uh, being able to attain very good health outcomes for the countries like India and the ASEAN member countries. Our mortality rates, our life expectancy, our uh, healthcare expenditures can be uh, put into a very efficient use and soon will have a functional and comparable experience between the two countries. Thank you very much and back to you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Harvoza. Uh, to starting with uh, Dr. Ratna. Uh, Professor Ratna, you are here. See, in the last speaker was Dr. Harbosa. What he said that uh, he talked about uh, education exchange and a good number of Indian students that go to Philippines uh, to pick up a uh, graduate degree in medical science. And good number of students that go to Manila to pick up aeronautical science and the flight courses. I'm not touching that. Only to uh, to the question which is about the health. But do you know that, that I can connect Dr. Harbosa and Dr. Professor Ratna? There is a point here that when they come back after completing MBBS, uh, they have to appear again and minimum need test in India to qualify next, which you are talking about, you know, the mutual recognition agreement, mutual recognition for degrees and diplomas. So where are we now, Professor Ratna, in ASEAN and India? We have a comprehensive agreement, goods, services, and investment. What is it doing? What are we doing on the mutual recognition? Particularly to, to respond to, you know, Dr. Harboza's point, that education exchange. What to you in a minute time? Thank you. And uh, it's a very important uh, part. As I was talking about, you know, the the goods part where the non-tariff barriers and measures can play a very important role. Similarly, in services as well, the mutual recognition agreement is very important. Recognizing each other university's degrees, and that is also not there, for one. Number two, if it is not there, then what you just suggested, you have to go through a, a minimum need test and something else. So it puts an added burden on our students to get the you know these uh, degrees and certificates from other universities and if you look in the global context that also uh, puts a challenge or disadvantage to both india and asean countries if an indian student goes to australia or a singapore many of these universities uh, uh, you know the degrees are recognized by western world so even if they don't get a job there they because of that recognition they go to us they go to canada they go to australia new zealand everywhere they get a job is this happening between India and ASEAN? The simple answer is no. So not only, uh, you know, uh, 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 the two-way process. And the second, I think, what is important here would be to also uh, linking between the, the universities, the, the, the colleges and the schools. And especially also, I mean, both ASEAN and India, and especially India is facing more bigger challenges. So you know such schools where you can uh, you know instead of going for a conventional study you can have uh, where business entrepreneur self-employment uh, kind of uh, studies could be recognized it will also address the social challenge of uh, unemployment uh, unemployment and we were talking about you know the bulging youth in both asean and, and india so employment will be a big challenge for both the governments and unless that is addressed. The education system is evolved in such a manner that instead of making focusing on only conventional research or getting into a job here and there, uh, some kind of a vocational institutes which can really train people uh, uh, to become uh, self-employed in all the sectors, including manufacturing, supply chain, or others, would be very very useful. And which I think there complementarity exists a lot between India and ASEAN. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me come back to uh, Professor Ruth. Uh, the questions like, you know, you have talked about no visa. That's our recommendation number one. Now, in in we, you know, gradually the countries are coming back to uh, the pre-COVID stage. Thailand has announced. I seen message coming that Thai Airways is requesting you to book your flight in in you know uh, book now 
fly in the first uh, first quarter in 2022, something like that. So because countries you're are yes. <laughs> oh really? Oh. Yeah. So, uh, so, so countries yeah, are you know, coming up with an exit plan, and you know, so so, so if I may ask you that in 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 case uh, you look for a no visa, how do you uh, look at it? You know, from say uh, next year, uh, I do not know when. Uh, the coming back and interacting again, engaging again uh, between the countries, India and ASEAN, uh, in terms of the mobility. What would you like to say on this? Well, let me put it this way. Uh, I know that this uh, request, I think, for, for no visa is something that is very important because I do not see connectivity happening if people cannot move freely you know, across uh, the, the, the two poles, which is uh, India and ASEAN. The challenge will be from a health perspective in terms of the various protocols that, that are needed. But uh, one thing, and we can look at the example of uh, Europe, is that uh, we, can, we can agree on some sort of travel bubble between India and ASEAN. And also, uh, we, we also have to acknowledge that at the end of the day, this uh, uh, virus will always be with us. So you know we have to learn to live with it. It will, it will not, it will not disappear. But it's a, about uh, governments not having a, a knee-jerk reaction each time there is a case of COVID. We, we have to learn to live with it, and then uh, the connectivity will will be further enhanced, and, and people can move. I understand the part related to. Uh, health protocols but if all the if there's a standardized or harmonized approach to health protocol between india and asean then then you know everything should be fine the challenge i think would be more within asean where each country has a different their own different health protocol so maybe linking with india may not be that difficult but in fact linking with each individual countries in asean may be more difficult Thank you. Thank you very much. And let me come to uh, Secretary Galvez. You know, he talked about uh, more cooperation between India and Philippines. He said that Philippines is making it the country as a hub for pharmaceutical uh, pharmaceutical hub, uh, and, and he looks for Indian investments. So, Secretary Galvez, please uh, let us know. You know, please tell us. You know, what's the exactly plan is between the Philippines government? You know, and Indian government in terms of making Philippines uh, um, a pharmaceutical hub. To, just to remind you, one Indian company has actually played a very important role making Philippines as an ITBPO hub. It's called WePro. Uh, it generated a job of 30,000 direct employment, several indirect employment. And I have seen by my, myself traveling there. Uh, so, so Indian companies, the private sector has immense power. Uh, so, and here is the links between private sector of the Philippines, private sector of India, and making Philippines the pharmaceutical hub. So, please uh, set some light in a minute time. How do you think that this hub can be unlocked in, in, in Philippines? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, uh, Professor. Uh, the first thing that uh, we, have, we have done is that uh, we, you know, we really uh, connect with, uh, with our Indian. Uh, uh, counterpart and uh, the DPI now is uh, moving on the possibility that um, the the Philippines will become a fill and finish for no a hub for no for for the vaccines. Considering also that we told uh, as SII, uh, the Serum Institute of India, they said that um, that Philippines is one of uh, their uh, mm -hmm. uh, primary target on really having some cooperation together with India. Considering that uh, the Philippines is one of the most most populous uh, ASEAN nation. I think uh, uh, the, the different pharmaceutical companies like Bharat and also uh, the SII are having uh, some interest on really uh, having some uh, close connection with our pharmaceutical uh, pharmaceutical companies. And considering that uh, we wanted to achieve um, vaccine security, we want to have a connection, strong connections with the with the you know, with the Serum Institute of India. And with that, uh, uh, we we uh, we wanted that uh, considering that uh, the vaccinations that we will be having is uh, up to 2023 or even 2024, mm -hmm. 2025. We want to, to have that sense of security of uh, having some connections with, with one of the best uh, pharmaceutical company in, in the world. And maybe uh, Dr. Ted Derbosa can, can expand on this. And uh, considering also that, uh, that uh, the Philippines is really wanting on, on uh, 
uh, inexpensive medicines, considering that uh, most of our people are uh, geographically isolated and challenged. Uh, you considering also that uh, the Philippines uh, 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 also have a majority of uh, living in a very poor conditions. Uh, mm -hmm. We wanted that uh, the, you know, the, you know, the universal healthcare and also the medicines will be accessible to those those people. Maybe a doctor can that boss can help because considering I'm not a doctor, uh, I'm a, I'm a military man, and uh, I, I think uh, Doctor Herbosa knows knows better. Yeah, yes, sir. The, that's right. The Philippines is now pushing for a virology institute. The, the law has been passed and it's been budgeted for 2022. Uh, and there are about eight companies that are being helped by our Department of Trade and Industry to actually establish uh, vaccine production in the Philippines. Several of these companies are uh, originally from India, and this will be a good uh, uh, opportunity for this mm -hmm. economic change. So as uh, was explained, it's uh, initially a fill and finish, but with the virology laboratory and the uh, scientific exchange that can happen between ASEAN and uh, India, I think we can actually uh, uh, succeed better because you will be looking at the economies of scale because you're looking not only of a per country population, but the ASEAN country, which is almost 1 billion uh, altogether. So if you're going to be producing and trade within ASEAN is already free. So if it, even if it's produced in one ASEAN country, it can freely move around. So that will create an uh, ease of uh, the, the borders that were being talked about previously, uh, the difficulties in terms of border control, et cetera. So the, the future really is good. The other one that's really coming in is that uh, the uh, health systems of India are slowly coming in. Uh, there are clinics and hospitals that are starting to introduce their systems in the Philippines. And I, I know of one outpatient uh, service that's trying to build and set up a big hospital. This will be big as we are, we have an infrastructure gap in the Philippines in the healthcare system. What will happen is uh, Indian hospitals and the Indian uh, hospital system is actually very efficient. In fact, it's uh, been very successful in the Middle East, in UAE, in uh, Dubai. I think such uh, opportunities also happen to be a big opportunity for establishing this uh, hospital, modern hospital systems to be established all over the different parts of the Philippines. We still have uh, several islands that were access to healthcare is still uh, difficult. And uh, uh, I mean, all of this has already been solved in uh, situations in India. Right. That's it, uh, Professor. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Arboza. Uh, now uh, I come to a final speaker. Uh, the last word from uh, Mr. Ifsad. Uh, you, you have seen that the discussions, uh, even though you know um, uh, you you may not be practicing uh, trade connectivity very much, you can understand that, that the common thread and all it's come lead to ultimately you know at this time and to me that the digital uh, connectivity you call it or digital uh, network, digital infrastructure, and the companies like TCS and many others you know in, in located there. They have a very strong role. Let me ask you a question that even then, how you know, or how do we connect these digital interfaces? Like uh, you said, uh, application of uh, big data analysis, which ASEAN is you know depending on. So how do you connect uh, several interfaces for trade, for example, customs or something on the e-commerce platform? Why it is not happening in a very rapid scale only between India and Singapore in, in the fintech sector. What do you suggest? What are the constraints in a, you know, in a very concluding way, if you can tell us? Yeah, I think uh, th that question warrants a, a, a segment by itself, but uh, allow me to summarize or to sort of uh, put together in a very comprehensive manner to address that. In fact, if you look at the, the way that the digital you know, sort of journey has been for India, uh, towards a digital first economy it has been accelerated primarily by policy and technology innovation for india's purpose in this case and steady progress has been made towards digitizing citizen services and economic activities by developing one of the most unique innovative and social economic infrastructure which we like to call it the digital spine mm -hmm. and this digital spine is primarily we feel it's built on four technology layers. First is a presenceless layer, 
the universal biometric identity, digital identity allow people to participate in any service anywhere in the country, which is the Aadhaar universal identifier. A paperless layer where digital records move within an individual's digital identity, enabling universal reach, which is the EKYC, eSign, and digital locker. And a cashless layer as the third one, where a single interface is all the uh, uh, where a single interface to all the country's bank accounts and wallets to democratize payment, which is a unified payment interface, UPI, as I mentioned earlier. And last but not least is the consent layer, which allows data to move freely and securely to democratize the market for data, which is the open personal data store. And in fact, this digital spine or India stack offers an interoperable platform that's enabling frictionless experience across the G2C government to consumer segment. For example, the Jandan, which is which has over 350 million plus uh, bank accounts for banking the unbanked. The Aadhaar, the universal ID, which is over 101.1 billion Aadhaar has been issued in the last six years. And almost INR 3,900 billion or US $51 billion in direct benefit transferred to 800 beneficiaries in FY 2020 alone. And if you look at the mobile payments, about 37 billion digital payments transaction has happened in FY 2020. And between the Jandan, Ada, and mobile payment enable business, uh, enable benefit transfer, about US $4 billion US dollars have been transferred and has benefited 330 billion beneficiaries towards supporting financial support during COVID-19 lockdown in April 2020. And I think what I'm coming at is the pl this platform that we have in India, it's also fostering innovation in the citizens through its you know, government to business to consumer segment. And how can we then leverage in a similar manner this India stack whereby we can bring it to a, a region like ASEAN, which is still, which is possibly, if you look at the size, it's still smaller than India, but what are the benefits and what are the learnings that we can get from the, such an ambitious sort of rollout in India that we can apply across ASEAN? Because if you look at ASEAN, it has tremendous potential. It is the fastest growing internet market in the world with 125,000 new users coming to internet every day. And the ASEAN digital economy is projected to grow significantly, adding estimated, as I mentioned earlier, one trillion US dollars to regional GDP over the next 10 years. But many significant roadblocks, unfortunately, stand in the way of realizing this potential. ASEAN has laid out an important pol pol policy measure and frameworks, including the AEC blueprint for 2025, the master plan on ASEAN connectivity 2025, and the E-ASEAN framework agreement to address these roadblocks. However, these ambitious goals will demand detailed research, visionary policy making, and substantial buy-in from regional stakeholders. And obviously, with a country like India, the tremendous opportunity for us to learn on how to implement at scale across the various developing countries that we have in ASEAN. In fact, allow me to just conclude in saying that in the next five years, is going to be an extremely crucial phase to transform ASEAN towards an inclusive, sustainable and integrated digital economy community. And this process requires strong commitment from ASEAN member states. It requires effective coordination of efforts among sectorial bodies of ASEAN and greater contribution of relevant stakeholders, including the private sector, which TCS is committed to upholding and to enabling in ASEAN. And this is a good platform, platform such as this, where we get the minds of both ASEAN and India to come together. And we learn from each other and we take the best practices and we try to you know deepen the relations that we have and to enable trade across both regions thank you dr Pro. Prabir. thank you very much in fact you did what i'm supposed to do nice summary of the two days discussion thank you very much and i with that i i conclude you know uh we with time is up and i have to hand over the mic to the organizers. Before I do that, I, I I personally thank all the speakers here, Professor Ratna, Professor Banomiong, Secretary Galvez, Mr. Arsad, uh, Dr. Harboza, and for their excellent frank opening discussion, many food for thought, many takeaways.
we have taken a note. Exit Bank, I'm sure, and ASEAN Center and AIBC will be coming out with a summary of the discussion, and we will be, will be shared with you and all the attendees. Uh, there's a report released uh, by Secretary East and other dignitaries. Please look at uh, this, this uh, monograph of the value chains, and uh, I'm, I'm sure this will bring you know, more um, opportunities and avenues for further work, further policy measures that we'll be able to draw for our policy uh, people. Particularly to Secretary Galvez for uh, thanks to him for sparing some time you did, you know, with your busy schedule. I know it's very difficult to bring you table. And thank you very much. And also your, your colleague, uh, Dr. Arboza coming here, Professor Ratna, once again, thank you very much. Uh, Professor Banomio and uh, Mr. Esad, happy Diwali in advance. So with that, I conclude and uh, I hand over to uh, Mr. Fanai for the last part of the program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Pradyuday and all the panel members for a very engaging deliberations. I think all key aspects of the subject discussed apparently addressing the questions that the audience must have in mind. So as we are now come to the last part of the webinar, let me now call upon Mr. David Sinadeh, Chief General Manager and Head of Research, Exim Bank, to propose the formal word of thanks. David, sir. Am I audible for now? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, thank you. It's a privilege for me to propose a word of thanks. Uh, Ms. Reva Ganguly Das, Secretary East, Ministry of External Affairs, Government of India. His Excellency, Mr. Jayan. Kopragade, Indian Ambassador to ASEAN Government of India, Dato Ramesh Kudamal Coach, ASEAN India Business Council, Kuala Lumpur, Professor Sachin Chaturvedi, Director General, Research and Information System for Developing Countries, RIS, Secretary Carlito G. Galvez Jr., Office of the Presidential Advisor on the Peace Process, Chief Implementer and Vaccine Czar. National Task Force Against COVID-19 Government of the Philippines, Dr. Teodoro J. Herbazo, Special Advisor, Philippines National Task Force Against COVID-19 Government of the Philippines, Professor Ruth Banomiong Dean, Tamasad Business School, Tamasad University, Dr. Rajan Ratna, Deputy Head and uh, Senior Economic Affairs Officer, UNESCAP. Mr. Mohammed Irshad, Head of Corporate Affairs for ASEAN, Tata Consultancy Services, Asia Pacific. Dr. Prabir Day, Professor and Coordinator, ASEAN India Center, RIS, and a very good friend. Delegates from ASEAN countries and India, ladies and gentlemen. It has been indeed a privilege for us to have all of you in our midst today. And on behalf of Exim Bank, I would like to thank Madam Riva Ganguly, Secretary of Government of India, Ministry of External Affairs, for having spared our available time to grace the occasion. Our presence in today's webinar is a testimony of the Government of India's efforts in promoting India's partnership with ASEAN. It was indeed an honor for Indian Exim Bank to have Madam with us today. I would also like to express my sincere thanks to His Excellency, Mr. Jayan, Kopragade, Indian Ambassador to Argentine Government of India for kindly gracing this occasion. We are also very grateful to Dato Ramesh Kodamal Koche, ASEAN India Business Council, AIBC Kuala Lumpur, and Professor Satin Chaturvedi, Director General RIS, for partnering us in this endeavor. We would also like to thank Secretary Galvez, Dr. Herboza, Dr. Ratna, Professor Banomiyong and Mr. Ishar for agreeing to participate in this webinar and share the available insights on various areas impacting and enhancing India-ASEAN relations. I would also like to thank Dr. Prabir Day, Professor and Coordinator, ASEAN India Center in RIS New Delhi for effortlessly moderating the panel discussion as well as sharing his views on the various subjects during the panel discussion. I also thank all the guests for joining us and for their active participation in the question and answer session. Indeed, this webinar has given us an opportunity to delve deeper and collectively turn ideas for augmenting collaboration between India and the ASEAN region. Once again, 
I would like to express our gratitude to all of you for your active participation in this webinar. And as mentioned by Mr. Fanai, soft copy of Exim Bank's publication release during the webinar is now available on our website. And all those who are interested can visit our website and download the same from the research publication section in the website. Once again, thank you. Thank you all of you for being with us today and for your support. Stay safe and stay well. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you.